Okay, we're recording, Andy. So I'd like to call the Finance Committee meeting to order um, today, being the 1st of December. Things go quickly as the year goes on. And uh, it's 1 o'clock or um, 5 after, so we're uh, go ahead and start the meeting as posted for 1. And um, I just want to start, as always, by reminding everybody that this meeting is being held via Zoom. Members of the public have access to the meeting via Zoom, uh, but it's um, important that everybody recognize that this meeting is being recorded for both um, audio and visual so that uh, people are recognized that there is a recording being made of this meeting. So I'm going to check with the um, members to make sure the committee members who are present can hear and be heard and we complete that process and then uh, quickly review the agenda and uh, move to public comment. Um, so Anna Devlin Gauthier is here. Present. And Lynn. Present. Uh, Bob Hegner. Present. Uh, Matt Holloway. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. And I'm here. So um, everybody's present at the moment except one. And we um, are expecting that she will, uh, that Alicia will join us. The agenda uh, was posted. Uh, we did identical agendas for both meetings when we posted for um, two meetings this week because we didn't know what we would uh, be able to uh, uh, get through in our first uh, uh, meeting and uh, wanted therefore to have the option to talk about any of the uh, pending items that are before the Finance Committee. And the one that we uh, spent the entire meeting on on Tuesday was the uh, Jones Library Project Supplemental Bond Authorization, which uh, concluded with uh, two motions that uh, were um, passed by the committee. And uh, so therefore, I think the only thing that's left, and I don't want to discuss it now because I'd rather get on to um, other items on the agenda, um, and that is uh, the, uh, the it, whether any members of the committee who have seen the draft of the committee report um, have any objection to my uh, making it a final and submitting it to uh, to Athena for posting. So if there's no request um, for changes to the uh, draft report, then I'm going to make the report final, and we have nothing else to talk about regarding the library. So I'm looking for hands from the committee. Kathy. Hi, Andy. Um, I didn't have a chance to re read it um, thoroughly, but there's a point at which you say that much of the discussion focused on the interest costs. I want to change that to the size of the ban, the short-term bonds required, and the interest costs associated with them, because I don't believe we we all understand that with the 15.8 million, that's the town obligation, the interest rates have gone up. We didn't really focus on the interest costs for that, per se. Um, so when I... Uh, even when I was looking at it. So it's it's a change. Um, a lot of the discussion, the proposal to increase was a concern about the interest that would be greater. I just want to, the focus was on the um, short-term bonds required um, to close the gap and the interest costs on that. I just want to insert that sentence. Um, otherwise, I thought it was clear. Um, I do think it, might be helpful the the what you put in as detail was the 15.8 the community reservation 
uh, Preservation Act and the overall debt, you didn't put it in that very nice table that we were given that showed the three bands. And I would just request that that get attached to this so that people can see what we're talking about. So the most recent estimate was about $750,000 under that column. Um, that otherwise, I think it um, reflects our discussion. Um, the I mean, I did, I it, did bring it up- It is in there by the attachments, so uh, just- Okay, I'm just saying that in the actual text, it says we focus on interest uh, you know, I no, I, I got that. I just yeah. Uh, yeah okay. So if up. it is in the larger, that's fine. So people can see what we're talking about. You know, I I did talk about the interaction with our capital five year capital plan, and I don't think it's crucial that that be in here unless others think that we should, because that's that's where my concern is. We've got a tough year. We already were in a tight year for. 2026, 2027, and this with the combined interest, the carrying costs. And it's not so much the 15.8 million. If I separate it out, that actually amazingly is only a small okay. increase. Okay. So, so, that, so here's my suggestion. If there's no objection from other members of the committee, since we're, we don't usually vote on the report, but I try and uh, so that everybody who's watching knows, um, I, the committee chairs are encouraged, and I absolutely believe that encouraged for the right reason to um, consult with committee members about uh, committee reports. Um, if there's no objection, I will uh, work with Kathy after the meeting by phone, and we will um, just insert a um, part of the part of a sentence or a sentence. Um, with the point that she raised about um, include pointing out the bans in addition to as a part of interest cost concern. If there's no objection, then we can go forward and um, the agenda, which will allow us to um, spend most of the, today talking about rental registration and to the extent we have time, we can talk about budget guidelines. Um, I uh, do want to again ask that uh, somebody um, try and get a hold of Rob Moore and see if he's going to be able to join us for that discussion. Um, but having said that, uh, if there's no objection from the committee, I would like to uh, ask for public comment and uh, just let everybody from who's uh, participating uh, in the public know that if they raise their hands, uh, we will recognize them. And uh, we ask you to try and stay about two minutes, but um, to discuss anything um, that you feel is related to matter that has or might come before the Finance Committee. Uh, we, um, it's not restricted to items on the agenda specifically for today it's uh, any matter relevant so if there's any requests for public comment and seeing no request for public comment no one has raised their hand so i think that we can move on uh, and since we really have author um, made a recommendation about the Jones Library, uh, that there be a uh, discussion with the town manager and uh, about the uh, MOU, trying to uh, clarify the MOU and bring it up to date was one motion, which was a request of the committee and then a recommendation of the council that um, it uh, approved the revision to the bond authorization as requested by the town manager. So those were the two motions that were passed at our last meeting. Um, sir, anything uh, else that we need to do or we can go on to rental registration. And um, I, I guess since Rob isn't, unless 
Paul, do you have anything that you want to say about the MOU or is there something to report? Not particularly. And I think we're trying to get Rob, I think Athena's trying to track Rob down. I don't think he received an invitation to attend today, unfortunately. So. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to um, go on and uh, we have uh, the uh, chair of CRC present. Um, we have previously received, and I put in the packet again for today, uh, a copy, copies of uh, the relevant in material that was provided to us by CRC, which was the proposed um, regulation, the proposed bylaw, and um, spreadsheet, which uh, we had available in Excel, as well as the printout of the recommended uh, fee structure that came from um, uh, the CRC. So uh, I, there's two people I want to uh, recognize fairly quickly. One is Mandy, whether she has any introductory uh, comments that she'd like to make at this point. And then um, I know that Kathy had asked for recognition early on because uh, she has been giving some thought to a um, an alternative approach. And uh, so, uh, Kathy, I assume that you still want to be recognized at the top. So, man, did you have anything introductory or do I, should I go ahead and uh, ask and recognize Kathy? I do not. I'm just here to answer the committee's questions if they have any. Okay, thank you. And um, I guess that um, if she doesn't have it um, and wants it, I would um, want Kathy to have the ability to share screen. So, Kathy, I'm going to recognize you. Okay, so I'm about to share you the screen. I, I gave three documents on the 17th of November. One was a memo. One was the spreadsheet showing some changes after the fact. And the third was a minor set of markups of the actual legis the um, regulatory language. So just in terms of background, um what I was what I've been looking at from the beginning is can we reduce the number of inspections so that they're more focused on the problem areas? and therefore reduce the number of inspectors and uh, be and reduce the cost for smaller property owners that are not a pro they're not a source of problems so what i what I, what i'll do is maybe i'll just do the um the memo andy and i'll i i made some changes this morning based on some comments that Mandy gave um, when we talked about it uh, in terms of why certain structures were in the fee schedule. So what I was looking at is if we reduce the rental permit fee for owning relatively few dwellings, and then for the overall fee and increase the number of units for which a fee was, we put the original proposal was to cap the number of units for rental registration at nine. So I looked at what if we capped it at 15? So we were ca still capturing more fees. Um, that's what I did on the, the rental fee side. And I went to a few other cities, you know, so um, as I know CRC already knows, everybody does it differently, <laughs> but many of them had more rental registration fees for the larger units. So they went to as high as $2,000 for the really big ones. So I just went to 15 units where you would pay fee and then um, go up on the inspection fee. But I actually look, could we avoid doing that um, as well? And that's what I'm going to show you is um, for the basic inspection, um, I'm looking at the combination. If you're a problem-free property, you'd pay rental registration and that's an annual and you might only have to pay the inspection fee once every five years. So I'm looking at that impact and then increase the fee for re 
repeat inspections. I didn't have any way to do it in the spreadsheet because we don't have an estimate of how many repeats. Um, and so, and then the other concept that I don't have any way of doing it is for those who really have been a problem, um, think of the inspection. The inspection to me is more intense because it's checking plump, unless it's just zoning. So, so I, and then in the actual um, frequency, the regulation had that at the point you hit 25 or more units, you started doing a sample with a sampling of at least 20% or starting with tw at least 25. And Mandy very clearly defined where there, there was that minimum. So you didn't have a, a drop off at, if you had 26, suddenly you were paying for fewer. I'm not sure why we couldn't reduce the threshold when I looked at the distribution to 10 or more and say that we don't have that 10, under 10, every unit would be inspected at 10 or more, we'd, we'd be doing a sample of at least 10%. And again, the goal is reduce the inspections, but leave the inspector the option, depending on what they found, of doing more. And this would reduce, you know, originally in the memo I gave everyone on the 17th, I said, why 25, why not 20, or why not 10? When I took another look at it, if we did 10, we're pretty dramatically increase, decreasing the number of inspections we have to do in year one, but we could be giving this juristic to go to more. And then if we do what Mandy had said is you have to set a minimum of, if it's 10 or more, you have to say at least 10. So the person with 11 units doesn't get a break. So they, they'd still be at 10. So then the other thing I brought up more than once that I think allowing the authority to inspect units that are already in undergoing federal inspections. I, I don't think we need to do that. And I understand the reason, and this was has been explained both by Rob Moore and then by Mandy, is we're inspecting for more than just the federal inspections we're inspect for, where they're particularly focused on health and safety, you know, living conditions. We're also looking at our zoning bylaws, which might include crowding, how many people are living in it. But for the, the places we have that have a large number of the, these units, I don't think that there's, they've been a major source of concern with um, either deteriorating properties or um, noise, trash, uh, neighborhood issues. They tend to be larger and more self-contained. So I'm looking for focusing the inspections on on areas that we can uncover problems and then go back and redo it. So what I did then was run through numbers. So I was always trying to make the fees cover the costs, you know, so that the fees would come as near to covering the costs. So I did just what ifs in the spreadsheet that if we did 10% fewer inspections or 20% fewer inspections, what does that do with the inspection costs annually? And then with the the permit fees, those are easy because you just multiply them. So you could balance if you reduced the number of inspection by 10 or 20%, you could be collecting enough inspection fees to cover the cost of inspectors. And I think we might need fewer. So those are, it interacts with the wording and the bylaw because the bylaw has this threshold of 25 when you start sampling. And I think we could start sampling at a lower threshold. So those were the areas. So a smaller random sample, 10% rather than 20, rate lowering the threshold. And then thinking about the two fees, the inspection fee and the um, registration fee, trying to keep them more affordable for the properties that are not of not concern. And Andy, I, if I stop sharing this one, I can just quickly show I think, but the spreadsheet is the hardest to look at in a quick way. So what I did, and people can do this later, and I know Mandy and CRC can do it, is like, I did what ifs. What if the inspection fee uh, 
going up. Let me go up. What if the base fee for the owner occupied was 100 and for all others was 150? Rather than 250, this is a decrease. And then the, the additional registration fees go up to 15. So looking at the amount of fees we collect over here, total fees collected, that more than covers the cost of registration based on what Rob gave us um, with a little bit of the, and then I looked at what happens if the uh, inspection fee, the one I think I gave in November 17th had 250 here, but then I went back to the original 150, but said, what if we did fewer inspections that the inspection cost at 80% or at uh, 90%, what would it be? And then what the total cost is and the total fees. So I was trying to do that in direction. So the concept is basically lower the fees um, for that are the general fees, apply it for the units on registration, more units. So we collect a bigger registration fee for the really big properties and focus the inspections on the problem areas. And as I said, I so I left the 250 for a repeat inspected. Um, so that's those are the trade-offs I was trying to do to get to a focus both of the inspection activity and the repeat inspection activity to be at um, areas of concern. So that's a lot to adjust to, but the concept is lower fees applied to more units, inspection fees uh, with fewer units, every unit inspected with more of a random sample starting at 10. You know, I looked at a threshold of 20 rather than 25 and you very nicely gave me a way to look at cutoffs. We don't have that many properties at, in the 2025 range. So if you, they would still be randomly inspected, all of them. And I will stop talking. So finance was asked to look at the fee schedules. And that's what I focused on. And the only part of the bylaws wording I did was where it triggered how many inspections we were going to do. Um, because the number of inspections drives the costs. And I went through a lot very quickly. I tried to do a simplified cover memo. Uh, concept cover memo. And I will stop sharing the screen. The December, the November 17th one marked up the bylaw, but Mandy pointed out to me why they'd put that minimum of 25 if the threshold was 25 rather than just a sample. So I think that rationale made sense. So whatever the threshold is, that becomes the minimum going outward. If it was 20, it would be at least 20. Right now, the bylaw says 25, at least 25 for all the larger units. So I'm willing to stop sharing this so I can see all the faces and I can go back over any part of this. Um, and I know Bob Hegner, because he sent me one, he was playing with fees as well, you know, looking at um, higher, lower fees, who it would hit. And then I looked at Burlington and Boston, which do it in completely different ways. Boston has very low registration fees um, and higher inspection fees. Burlington seems to load everything on the registration fee. Um, so, you know, in terms of any kind of examples, so I was trying to do a minimum while enabling us to get into properties. And again, the larger properties, if you suspect a problem, you're probably gonna see it in the basic um, building as well as each unit. Um, so the sampling will be, the initial inspection is gonna say, what's the boiler system look like? What is the electrical system look like? Um, that's it. Trying to make this less bureaucratic, less onerous, um, but, and targeted, to get at what we're concerned about. So maybe I should uh, ask Mandy if you have any thoughts about it, either 
on behalf of CRC or just from your extensive work with this? So I think the changes to how many inspections that that Kathy just talked about is a potential discussion for the whole council, but I would not say it's necessarily a discussion for this committee um, because I understand, Kathy, that you're going to argue that that discussion needs to happen because then you have to you 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 need to know that to set the fees. Um, but the committee, I believe, should be discussing the fees and making a recommendation based on the bylaw that CRC has voted. And the council, if the council deems it necessary to vote an amendment to a bylaw, the council can either choose to adopt the fees as recommended, however that is, or um, send it back for modification based on the bylaw that is adopted, if it is adopted, um, or it could adopt fees and then immediately request that the Board of License Commissioner relook at the fees in light of the changes made potentially by the council to the bylaws, because once the council adopts a set of fees under the bylaw, if the bylaw is adopted, the Board of License Commissioners goes there. Um, CRC discussed a lot of things um, about fees, um, uh, many of which Kathy's bringing up, right? Um, I think the discussion is, does this committee want a, want a permit fee that is, want to make a recommendation of a permit fee and inspection fee combo that relies on more steadier permit fees coming in that will sub um that would cover both the cost of administration of the per program and in terms of all of the permitting of the program that administration as well as a portion of the costs of the inspection part of the program and then use the inspection fees to supplement that and cover the remaining costs by recognizing that the permit fee is covering a portion of those inspection fees um or does the committee want a recommendation that says the permit fees will cover mostly only the permit portion and the inspection fees need to go sky high to cover the inspection portion and depending on how that is rewritten means you have to look at it differently um it, I, you can do a lot right <laughs> and anyone who's looked at the excel spreadsheet you can play with the numbers uh unlimited um but i think the committee just needs to discuss what way it wants to go um, in that, um, you know, and, and it would be perfectly reasonable, I would say, for the committee to discuss whether it wants a cap at 10 units or a higher number. And I don't think that matters with whether the bylaw is adopted as is or with re modifications. That's something I think the committee can discuss um, and make a recommendation on. We CRC made one at, at 10. It's what uh, the building commissioner had recommended, and we went with that. But that's certainly up for debate on on whether it people the committee thinks it's necessary. I guess at this point, that's all I have. Yeah, I don't know if Rob will join us. Uh, did, um, if he doesn't, uh, is there anything about why he was recommending ten that you can recall to share? I think it was because at that number, the set of buildings, if you look at our split of um, parcels and rental units on parcels, starting at 10, first of all, it's a number that is easily determined from a reporting view. Every time CRC's gotten a reporting, it's been singular up to 10 and then, um, 11 to 20, or actually I think it's 10 to 19, 20 to 29. And so I think that's partially why, because that's how the system reports and all. And so it's easier to gauge um, 
up to 10 versus say up to 15. Um, but the other reason was when you look at that spreadsheet and, and the reporting of it, there, the, there is a significant drop off starting at buildings or parcels with 10 or more units. Um, there's a significant drop off as how many there are because the bulk of our parcels have less than 10 units on them from a parcel basis. And so I think that was the other reason he, he said 10, that he, he recommended 10. Kathy? Um. You know the 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 sh sheet that I did um, when we made the change, what a year or so ago, Mandy on the fees. Um, we went up to two hundred and fifty, mm -hmm. and then we gave a break to owner occupied. We've been, as you just pointed out, we've been generating more than the cost of running the permitting but that's helped subsidize, that's helped cover the cost of inspections. Um, so if we now are charging for inspections, one of the logic is to be go easier on the registration fees because everyone has to do that. It, 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 it's My thinking is people are running perfectly decent rental units. They're, when we inspect them, it turns out they're they're great. You know, they've got long-term residents in it. They're not a problem in the community on any level. They are not violating other pieces. So we should minimize the, the system costs for, for that group. So that would be my argument on, you can go lower on that. And I didn't have to go sky high on the inspection fee if I reduce the number of inspections, you know, so that if I, and as you said, that's in the bylaw draft right now is start at 25 and do a minimum of 25 and everything up to 25 you do every unit I don't see a strong rationale for that and when we sent this to finance I made sure we at least had uh, an open door to look at the wording where it had to do with anything with frequency where frequency was going to affect the financing so if I don't go over to that threshold the inspection fees do have to be much higher, as you just said. You know, we won't collect enough money to run the program. If, so that's why they're interactive. And I'm fine with saying I have to do this again at the council level. <laughs> um, but I thought finance should be at least recognizing that the cost of the inspection side of the program is driven by how how many units we're going to inspect. And if we don't say that, then we can't estimate it. And that's being driven by the wording in the bylaw. It's not It's not left to the discretion of anybody the way it's written right now, unless we change that wording. So I did, I did think that the, I did look at the thresholds. There aren't there aren't that many between 10 and 25. You know, the, the, the really big units start at 100. Um, and random, and I think 10% is a decent sampling amount um, if you're looking for health safety faulty systems. Um, and then you can use your inspection force. And I will say, and I see Bernie's hand is up. My, I don't, I want to say this as non-negatively as I can, but my recent experience on the health inspector side has indicated that we can have a tendency to go too far, you know, to be too narrow in what we're looking for. And I want this, I want our inspectors to be, which I think the building inspectors for the most part have been, is really looking for what we think are problem rentals, um, defined in any way you want to do it. I'm not looking for, ooh, this isn't quite right in some way. So I don't want it to be um, harassment in any way, um, which is what some recent businesses, and I got up to 12 or 15, so I wasn't just one or two. So I want to make sure we focus on what we think are the problems. So Bernie, I'll go back to you, but that's why I had to look at the bylaw wording because it drove your inspection estimates. Otherwise, as you said, you had to go up much higher on the inspection fee to cover the cost of inspections because of the number that were specified in the bylaw that we had to hit 
every single unit up to 25. And that was when we started doing sampling. That's a response to the interaction on the inspection line, not on the registration line. Andy, real quickly, I'm just noting that um, Anna left the meeting at about 135. Okay. So I see Bernie, Bernie's hand is up. So this is, yeah. it's clearly the mixes and matches are infinite here, but I was really looking at reducing the cost of the total program and focusing it. And that the focus is on the inspection is the focus. Everyone has to register. Bernie? We can't hear you, you're muted. Click that off. Yep. Um, let me just start off by saying the quality of the inspection, whether the inspector is being harassing or too uh, too precise, uh, less than forgiving. I mean, I've been you know I've been subject to two inspections in this town. I've also been had people complain to me about inspections in other towns that I've managed. That's a supervisory issue. It has nothing to do with the fees. Exactly. If you have a complaint about the quality of the inspection, and they go to that department head, and they interact with the department head, and have the department head fix it. So if you've got 12 restaurateurs who are complaining about the quality of their inspections, that doesn't count in terms of talking about rental inspections, okay? As a former administrator, my preference would be to have as much of the cost covered up front as possible. Because in the, the number of inspect, there'll, there'll be we we got a mix here of um, registration fees and a known number of inspections. That combination should be sufficient to cover the cost of the program, including uh, benefits for the employees. And my my concern here is we're raising headcount, and that's going to be an ongoing cost. And if the program is, it's like the cops. If the cops are remarkably successful, nobody gets a ticket. Nobody gets arrested. If this program is remarkably successful, we won't have any reinspections. <laughs> it will, it, it, you know, and, and, and our income will go down as a result, which is why you don't use the police department as a revenue source. So I'm agnostic as to which scheme here we uh, endorse. But the bottom line is we should have uh, a known number of um, registrations, a known number of inspections, and between the two, they all the costs should be covered. Now, I'm not seeing, I, Kathy, I didn't have, uh, in, until you put it up on the screen, I didn't have access to your spreadsheet. Um, and again, I'm agnostic as to which, whose spreadsheet we use. <laughs> I just wanna make sure that we're covering the costs. You know, I just, Bernie, I submitted it on the 17th too, and I, I totally agree with what you just said. And I think it's a principle for whatever we say, Andy, that I was looking for any kinds of changes, the sum of the fees from the two sources, the inspection fee and the rental fee, uh, the inspection fee and the registration fee covered the projected costs. Um, the costs are a function of how many inspections we think we're going to do a year. So that's where I went to um, the threshold for inspections. But I totally agree with you that we need to start it out. So it's self-financing. And in, in a steady state, if the miracle occurs that we've identified the problem houses, they've cleaned up their act, and everyone is on a five-year plan, that would be a success. And at some point, we would have inspectors doing something else, um, <laughs> you know, so, um, but in any case, you know, that would be not a bad outcome of a program if we got to that point. Um, or if they now had a list of, these are the ones we're really gonna focus on, um, that would also be a very good outcome that most people are on five-year plans. Uh -huh. Um, yes, uh, I agree that the 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 combination of um, registration fees and inspection fees should 
more than uh, should cover the cost of the program. I think we've, I think the spreadsheets, however they they've done that, we've we've done that on in the spreadsheets. Um, I also want to emphasize again my support for keeping the costs as low as possible, the total costs as low as possible for those, uh, you know, landlords who have fewer units. Um, it's just, I, in my, my experience in hurricane recovery is that what we call a small rental program was different than a large rental program uh, because the needs of small l landlords that have small numbers of units are different than landlords that operate large buildings. So I, I do think that um, the, the, the latest version of this gets us closer to what I would see is the ideal. But, uh, you know, I, again, I just would emphasize the importance of trying to keep the costs as low as possible for those people who only have a few units. Thank you. Um, I think I was uh, just curious why Amherst Media is actually now in the analyst group. They've been um, covering the finance committee meetings. Sometimes um, they don't join in time to be here from the beginning, but, um, and I'll just send them the recording, but they're covering now. It's yeah, I, I usually I see them in the attendee side. Um, so going back to where we were, uh, I guess the, the, I want to make sure that I understand and get a consensus, get a sense of the committee members present about uh, the concept of uh, making sure that the fees covering the cost of the program. The one thing that we had discussed, where we talked about two things. One is that we did not think that it was advisable that we use uh, any money from the general fund budget tax um, portion um, and, and other, the just general fund budget in particular, uh, but that uh, we were open to the uh, money from the university that was part of the strategic partnership agreement that was uh, to given to us to address the housing uh, problems that are caused by the universe, number of university students in the community. So that was $100,000. So when you're saying this, um, are we assuming the $100,000 can be used for this program or are you trying to get the fees to cover the entire thing? And not use the hundred thousand. Just want to make sure that we're clear on this. Um, CRC's goal was to generate revenues in between needing to use all of the hundred thousand and needing to use zero of the hundred thousand because it right now is really just a true an educated estimate that is done based on as much information as we have, right? Um, but um, until we get through a year or two, it it is just that, an estimate that is that way. And so um, we have been, CRC was, was told that it could assume the use of that 100,000 for this program, um, but, we were hesitant to assume the full use and get and and make an estimated and a fee based recommendation using all of it just in case our estimates and calculations were slightly off um and so the goal was to find a number that was comfortably within that margin i would say it was 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 how i would put it the way I read the spreadsheet, if I read it correctly, that was submitted, it was assuming more of it would be used, or a good part of it would be used. Unless the revised spreadsheet came out differently. Yeah, Andy, when, when I did it, I didn't 
try to use the 100,000. I tried to get them really close, which is when I went to the threshold of 10 for inspections. And, you know, on, on what Bob said of trying to minimize for the, if you say those with not very many properties, if you did under six or six or less, um, the original one we had was if you weren't owner occupied, it was 250 plus another 50 for each of the other five. So it was 550 to register, and that would be every year. And then the first year inspection was 150 and another 150 for each of the units. So another 50, it's 2000. So trying to go lower on the registration fee. Um, so since it, and have the inspection cover more, but have the inspection number of inspections we're doing not be as high, allowed you to go lower on the inspection fee um, while still covering costs. So, so it is definitely interactive with how often we're inspecting. Um, and I have no problem with inspecting every unit for the smaller ones and if, what's smaller under 10 in the first year. And then those, well, I'm hoping a huge number of them get the five-year dispensation that they're, they're fine. Um, the owner-occupied ones and not some places completely exempt owner-occupied altogether from from inspection and we exempt them from the unit fee. So I think that's why I got to the more complicated of when do we start, at what point are we inspecting every unit and when do we start sampling? And that's in the bylaw, that's not, we wrote that into the bylaw, we didn't leave that for later determination. We, I mean, that's the bylaw we're looking at um, in terms of regulations. So it was trying to reduce for the problem free. So Bernie, I know at one point you said if someone owns two or three properties, they're not necessarily low income, but if they own two or three properties and they're keeping them up, they've got great tenants, we're not we're not trying to burden them either. That that's that's an okay small business to be in. Um, having a few properties you're operating for rental. We would like to go after the the people that um, the owners that don't pay any attention to the condition of their property in terms of uh, what the what what it does to the tenants, and they don't pay any attention to what it does to the neighborhood in terms of they're only supposed to be four, and there are eight people living there with eight cars and with trash. You know, so that's what we're. I think that's that was why we started on this whole, whole trying to figure out which those are. Um, and being able to go get inside the house to see what else is going, the home to see what else is going on. Right. Yeah, I, I just, I want to go back to just, again, having not frankly had time to look at this. Are we charging appropriately for the service we're providing versus are we not doing that and this is an issue that's been brought up by you know some of the some of the owners of these properties in other words we're so, we're we're charging for a service we're providing and it's not a tax it's a question and you know yeah, Bernie, Bernie, i see Bernie's uh, hand is up the, the answer right now would be our rental permit collection fee collects more than just the rental permit registration, but it's including the inspection, you know, so it's, it could be, if you say that's the package deal, we are inspecting houses. We're just not inspecting them until there's a complaint. So Bernie, you know, but I think aligning those fees with costs is really important. Bernie? You can't, you can't parse out the staff that you, you, you have a, you have a department and you have to pay for the department. You have to pay for those people who are involved in the program, whether the program means an initial license or an inspection or a follow-up or whatever. So um, again, you got to make sure that you're covering the costs and coming down to whether we use the hundred thousand dollars from UMass or not, 
Uh, I mean, I can see using that money in, in the initial year to help get things started because we're not going to get 100% of our money collected. We're going to end up doing more inspections than we probably planned on for a variety. It's because life works that way. But in my um, my simple my simple word world of municipal finance, there's hard money and there's soft money. Hard money is what you know you can raise. Soft money is what comes in on a variable basis or can go away. And that's the UMass money. So if we're going to have a program, it should be self-sustaining. And if UMass gives us money, then that gives us the opportunity to enhance the program in some way without raising the fees. Or it gives us the opportunity to uh, uh, to, to cover for those un, un, unanticipated expenses or for emergencies. So whatever fee, again, whatever fee structure we use needs to cover the costs. And I think Pitt Lynn's point is, and not generate a surplus. It needs to be, if otherwise it looks like a tax. We need well, to- we None need of, to none of, <laughs> that's not exact. Any program that the town operates mm -hmm. has got to cover its costs. And if we have an, an excessive amount of money over that we earn over covering our costs, that's an issue. And that's regardless of what we do. It, the, the challenge I mean, we can't, we, 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 what you can, and the DOR will allow you to um, add on some costs to cover things like capital improvements, uh, equipment repair, uh, unforeseen circumstances. So if your 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 fees are covering 105, 110 percent of your costs, the Commonwealth is not going to be concerned. The Commonwealth being DOR. If you're now all of a sudden coming in on 120, 125 percent over, you're going to hear from the state, and they're going to tell you to back off. So um, you, you know, nobody. <laughs> I, I've been part of the nonprofit world for a long time. And, you know, for-profit corporations get to make a profit. Not-for-profit organizations need to retain revenue. And if you, if you have uh, a system where you, you, you are guaranteed that you're going to lose money year to year to year because you haven't covered your costs or you haven't given yourself a little bit of a cushion, you're not doing the taxpayers any service. You're constantly scrambling to make this stuff up. So again, whatever table we use has to cover our costs. And um, nobody likes to pay taxes. Nobody likes to pay extra for services. Um, you know, it was real nice when you could go to the town clerk's office and, you know, get something notarized for free. Can't do that anymore. Um, but that's the fact of life. You got you to be able to, to, to keep that program running. So you know, I'll get off my soapbox. Mandy, is there was there an indication from Rob about whether it would take the full five years to do the initial inspection on all units, or was it, uh, did he anticipate that he could do that in less time? He anticipated that with the let me look up the number of inspectors. Um, with his estimate of needing, I believe it was three inspectors. Um, um, that they would be able to, as the document is written, as the regulations and bylaw are written, be able to complete all required inspections to issue permits. So all of the, the permit inspections within five years. That That is how he made his estimate um, for doing that. Um, I, I did want to add, uh, Kathy's been talking about, well, if we reduce the number of inspections needed for the large ones and all, we can reduce the number of inspectors. I would hesitate to assume that is true until talking to Rob or how much you can reduce until talking to Rob. I can't answer that myself. Um, Rob would have a much better idea of if there's a reduction of X number of inspections required under the bylaw, could the estimated number of inspectors needed be reduced. I, I can't, I cannot answer that. Um, um, Rob should be able to answer that. Um, 
you know, based on things. So, but his estimation was three inspectors for this program would cover the ability to do all of the required inspections within five years. And that I think his estimate included an estimate of the required inspections and his guess at how many would need follow-up inspections. Um, but um, so not just the raw number of 300 inspections or whatever, but how many would him guessing with how many are we going to have to go into a second time because there are violations and stuff. Um, I think that was his estimate that he could fully do the program, the startup program in five years with three inspectors. Did I say that in part because uh, I had assumed that if we used the UMass money for startup, uh, and no matter whatever number of years we want to make the assumption for, that that helps us get it going and that once we've gotten the initial inspections done in all units, if uh, the program is successful, the number of inspections required should decrease. And then the uh, number of inspectors required might be adjusted uh, by administrative decisions, uh, but not until we've completed the first round. Yeah, I think that's his assumption. I, I can't totally speak for him, but but he was looking at the first five years, full inspections of every unit at least once. And then I I believe he would then reevaluate and and look at that. But but he was looking at startup five years and inspectors needed for that. Which is why I think that I would put forward that we should consider using the UMass money to um, help control other costs for the first, for the startup period uh, and uh, make the uh, um, assumption that once they've made the commitment to it, as they have with other commitments they've made, like um, the supports they've given for fire EMS, that um, if they see that it has value to their students as well as value to the town, that they will have a motivation to continue to uh, provide that money. Uh, and that would uh, help. So I would, I guess that I'm more comfortable making that. I don't know if others are. Um, and uh, then the question is, can we come up with enough fees to make it balance? And I did have the same problem that Kathy was describing, given the numbers that you work with, then how it plays out the spreadsheet is that uh, if you, change, you have to make a much bigger change to inspection costs uh, to make a significant difference in the bottom line than uh, anything you're doing for the uh, registration fee, which is paid annually and paid over all unit, all units, not just the units being inspected. Mandy, you muted the. Thank you. Sorry, the fee sample that that CRC recommends the 100, the 250, and then the 150 for inspections per unit um, requires as a base revenue um, using $15,000 of the 100,000 on estimate from the safe and healthy neighborhood revenue. So using a small portion of that, um, if you up the um, the max number of, you know, right. And that's with a cap, a guardrail of 10 units on the additional fee for the permitting. If um, you up that to 15 from 10 um, and you decrease the 
base permit fee for all parcels that are not owner occupied from 250 to 200, um, you are using $57,000 of the safe and healthy neighborhood revenue um, instead of $15,000. So you're a little lower, but if you decrease that all other parcel permit fee to 150 and keep the cap at 15 units instead of 10 units, um, you would need to use more than the 100,000 because you'd be 112, $13,000 short. So increasing that cap as Kathy had initially proposed does allow for a slight reduction in the permit fee. I haven't played with increasing the cap and then potentially reducing the inspection fee, um, but that was all keeping the inspection fee at um, 150 per unit, um, but increasing the cap for the permit fee to 15 from 10 essentially. But I guess the other thing that I just wanted to recognize and um, that is that I think that we generally make an assumption that landlords, um, when they have the added costs, whether it be because of tax increase or utility cost increase or whatever, they try and get that uh, paid for by their customers or their tenants. So that uh, what we do uh, here uh, is going to affect some rents, if not all rents. And so when we think about our people we represent, we represent a lot of renters. I would, also, I would also suspect that those increased costs could be written off as a business expense in the taxes. Exempt from debt. Is that what you said? You're tired. You're muted again. <laughs> I did the microphone button work. I would think that if this is an increase in their uh, business expenses, that that might be um, something that can be written off. So they they may not have to pass on all or any cost, but that varies from person to person. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Oops, excuse me. I wanted to ask Paul, um, but let, I'm not sure he's, I know he's around, but uh, I believe the UMass agreement that we just signed is a five-year agreement, but actually in effect, it's four years. And does that mean, Paul, we're three and a half years into it or where are we on it? So we're in we're in year oops we're in year two. Okay, all right, but but we can assume based on the fact that we have this written agreement that we do have the money from UMass for at least four years. Depending on when you implement this. Yes. Right. Well, if, oh, true. Exactly. Um, thank you. And the other uses that we can think of for safe and healthy neighborhoods, spending uh, press as an example, because uh, we could uh, be using our press uh, responders to help address problems that are in neighborhoods and work with tenants. Certainly our community safety uh, police officer has been doing that and trying to work with uh, renters to make sure that they know what they need to do to comply with the law. Uh, there may be programs that come out of uh, other departments like uh, public health, for example, that may also contribute. So we do have other uh, things that we spend money on that uh, can affect safe and healthy neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make an assumption that there's no other use for the money. Right. Lynn? 
Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that for that particular piece of money, we know how long it's available. Thank you. So we need to um, figure out what to do as far as a recommendation or recommendations. I think that there's two models that are out here now. One is the model that CRC has uh, recommended. And uh, I tried to play around with uh, the spreadsheet to see if I could make changes in that would have significant effects. And aside from a um, slightly increasing the number of units that are covered so that um, somebody who's really in the business is uh, um, paying a little bit more. And for people who have just one renter in a unit that we try and help that person out a little bit uh, because that's more likely to be just the single home that's being rented is, uh, but nobody's really actively in the business. It just happens to be one rental. So I played with that and I couldn't make it that it would make a big, big difference without major shifts. Uh, so I really appreciated CRC's dilemma when they said, okay, now we got to get some help on this and get somebody else to look at it. Uh, the other model that, um, and it's very helpful that Kathy has done that work because uh, you suggested something that would be a more significant change, but uh, it carries implications with it too. Some of which are not really within the control of the committee. They can only be something that's recommended by the committee. Kathy and then Bob. Hey, as, as Mandy pointed out, I what I did affected two sections. The registration fee assumed you stopped charging for the incremental unit once you hit nine. If you make that 15, you get more from the registration fee program. So Andy, you're right. There's no way of playing with this if you don't do something on those lines. So in going down on the fee, I went up on the units and I'd I literally picked 15 because I was targeting a certain amount of money. It wasn't a 15 is the right number. And I looked at, as I said, a few cities, 15 would be $900 if you had a hundred unit place, you know, so it's not huge to register it. So if you pick 20, you'd get even more with that marginal. And, and then when you go down to inspections, the only way to change the frequency of inspections is to look at the bylaw. You can change the fee and Mandy, as Mandy said, to get to 100% coverage of the cost by, if I didn't go up to more units in the fee, in the registration fee, you had to go up for a lot in the inspections. So that's when I started looking at changing the threshold. So her, of course her numbers are right because Mandy knows how to work with a spreadsheet. <laughs> but when you, plug them in, if the, if the cost of running the program, which we were given is $478,000 with three inspectors, then that's your target. And you're either short a little bit or you're short a lot or, or you're short more, but you're not short a hundred thousand. Um, you're not short a hundred thousand. So we've got some wiggle room um, in, in looking at these just in the spreadsheet alone. So I never was quite sure when this was referred to us, whether you, there was a genuine request to change the fee schedule or just to say, what do you think about it? So I went in to try to change the fee schedule, trying to lower the impact on the properties with fewer units. And I figure a problem property is going to get hit with reinspections. So that's where their, their costs are going to be much higher. And we want their costs to be higher. And it's higher because of the inspection costs. So we want that to be true. Um, 
So I have no problem with a higher reinspection fee <laughs> just because you only need a reinspection if you had a major reinspection, if there was a big problem. Um, and, you know, years ago, I wanted to a one, two, and three strikes are out. If you didn't fit, clean up your act after a few years, um, uh, we shouldn't have them on the books anymore. But in any case, you know, just really thinking that. So that's where mine went, but to make it balance completely, I have to go to the bylaw, Mandy, you know, on a, what's the threshold for starting to do every single unit. Um, and if you don't lower it from 25, there is a shortfall if we don't go up on the inspection fee. And so I, and going up on the inspection fee then hits the small property, you know, the, I've only got three or four units. So the first year becomes more pricey. So I was trying to hold the 150 when the second time I looked. So, so those are, as I said, those are conceptually where I went, whether 10 is the right number, 10 just reduced the number of inspections by a lot that were required is why I went to 10. With a minimum of 10, with the right to do more in the properties that have, remember this, this is more than 10 units in the same building. Um, so it's a pretty big place when when that when you look around town. So that so you've got two different possibilities starting with what CRC presented to us. So I have no I I know where I would want to go with it, but I have no idea mm -hmm. what the rest of the committee thought we were supposed to do other than play with the spreadsheet. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, reiterate or, or echo what Andy, you said that you really can't, and Kathy, to some extent, you can't reduce the fees significantly with putting, uh, unless you take limits off of specific parcels and, you know, apply the fee to every unit within the pot. You just can't do it. There, it there's, there's no way that there's enough <laughs> enough wiggle room in the in the equations to do that. So if we're and I understand why we don't want to um, hit every unit with an with a with a fee um, that you know will exclude some for the larger units. That's fine, but we're not going to get to what I would consider to be an ideal situation as long as we have a limit. You know, we've we've put a maximum number. Uh, of units per, uh, you know, uh, uh, for fees. Um, so it's, it's, I think we're, as I said, the, the most recent version of this is closer to what I would think is, uh, you know, what I would like to see. It's better than what we, we first saw. So um, I think we've, we've, we have succeeded somewhat in reducing the cost to those individuals with smaller numbers of properties uh, or smart, smaller numbers of units. Um, we could probably do a little more, but it's going to be hard without um, increasing the number of units per landlord that we're willing to apply a fee to. And, and that's what it's the cap of nine, Bob, on the first line in the red. Right. And so if you go up to 15, you can go down on the. It's what you're saying. Then you can go down on the the initial fee right. and and the place that only has three units will never and the cap of nine doesn't raise the cost that much for a truly big one you know a hundred unit one it's you know it's clearly raises the cost for someone with six <laughs> or uh, eight units because you were capped at or 10 units so i i picked 15 just to get that revenue up enough yep. to to make it possible to have the numbers work um, so we're down to uh, only one variable that really matters that interacts with the registration fee. <laughs> Otherwise, what CRC gave us worked. You know, they had a registration fee if it was non-owner of two hundred and fifty, which is pretty substantial. If you're, you know, if then you own five other units, um, so going down to one hundred and fifty required me to go up on the number of units you know, instead of nine. And thank you for giving us the interactive because I found the cell <laughs> buried in another place that in where where the where it said nine and I could 
turn it into 15. So thank you for allowing that possibility. So with the change that you're proposing um, serve only a fee purpose or would it also, would it, what would it do to the purposes of the bylaws stated in the bylaw? So to go super slowly, the, the fee on registration, if you go down on the initial fee and go up on the total units, you're collecting more money when people register. As right. Mindy said, if you don't change the bottom line, you're short, um, you, would you say 50,000 or something dollars? So you'd have to subsidize more than they did if you left the inspection fee at 250. Um, so that's when I started looking at um, the threshold. But you you know, Mandy did the quick math. If you just did what I did up on the other line, you know, the inspection costs are the big costs. So we had, I'm sorry to do this, I'm number driven, but the inspection costs were 340,000 and the fee registration costs were 138. And that's what got you to 478 total. That's the one you're constantly looking at. So if you do something on the top, unless you go up to more units, you know, than not 15, but you go up to 20, so more collection at the registration, but you're only collecting it on the really much bigger units, you're going to be short some money that could be the UMass money, but you're not short $100,000. You're short something less than that. If you want totally balanced, you go to the threshold, I think, that we start doing every unit. And, but as Mandy said, Rob would have to tell us if that instead of three full-time inspectors is... 2.75 or something in steady state. And the weird way I read the Boston one, they have a list of possible inspectors when they need more <laughs> that they call on. So they didn't staff up for everything. They have a, you. this is an, a certified inspector when you need it. And they actually give the property owner an option of you want one of ours or one of the certified lists. But but, but that's the issue, Andy. You know, I was just trying to do the regist make the registration less fee less onerous for small number of units by increasing the cost to the large number of units, the places with 25, 30, 40 units. It doesn't increase the cost a lot for them. But, and I, you know, when you register a place with 100 units, if you need to know, is it a one bedroom a studio? It is it a this? How many are in every one? It's got to be more, more fields that you're setting up. It may not be more staff time, um, but it's there's just more units, and then that triggers how are you going to inspect those places? So hopefully that's clear. You know, so that 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 variable that cap of nine drives a shortfall if I try to lower the fee. If I go to 15 or if I went to 20, I don't, you don't have to have any shortfall from what CRC gave us. So that's, that doesn't require going to the, ins how often we inspect. And Mandy, you might say, why did you choose 25 at the, as the beginning point for sampling? Why not 20? Why not 10? It seems like whatever the point is for sampling is when you get to the bigger buildings, you don't feel need, you don't feel a need like you have to inspect every unit. So mm -hmm. I looked, there were enough at 10 that I decided 10 was as reasonable a threshold as 25. Um, there aren't a lot of buildings with those size that you jump way up to 100 then or 50. So 25 seemed to me as arbitrary as 20 or 10. So going lower would reduce. But as Mandy said, that interacts with the bylaw. That's, that inter interacts with the bylaw. So Lynn, when do you expect to um, do the second reading on the bylaw? <laughs> uh, it's scheduled for two, for Monday, but it's dependent on having a fee schedule that is recommended. 
so if this fee schedule is recommended or a fee schedule is recommended, we can do the second reading and vote on the bylaw on Monday. If not, we can uh, defer it to um, December 18th. And that would be the other option. I, I really, I do wanna stress that I think at least from everything I've heard from Rob in these meetings, uh, the goal is to start this program, start ramping up so that this program can be put into effect for the big rental cycle, which in Amherst begins in the fall. But registration begins, I believe, even uh, in May. Renewals start in like May. April and May. Yeah. Thank so you. Right. But the, oh. the permits are issued July 1 to June 30. And so from Rob, the goal would be to have this in effect for the next permit year, the FY25 permit year, if it passes. If, and yep. given the fact right. that we're going to have some changeover in council, although we're about to recognize one of our new counselors, um, there's always a little bit of a slow startup period so that it would be advantageous for Rob, if we could get this done before right. the end of this term. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I really urge us to come to some conclusion and get it done. As a counselor. Yeah, <laughs> I, um, let me go to counselor to be Hegner and then uh, counselor elect. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I think Bernie said this at an earlier meeting, I think at some point we just have to make a decision and go with it. Um, and we will have ample opportunity to review what's happened over the last, over the next year, the next two years and, and come back and say, it's working. It's not working. We need to adjust this. But I think at some point we just have to get it done and, and, and move forward. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with, these this fee schedule that's in the the package um i mean it's not what i would do ideally but it, as a starting point i think i'm okay with it and I, I just think we need to move forward yep yeah kathy i was thinking for a second so, I'll, 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 I'll try to uh, stay where Bob just was and the one amendment I would do to the fee schedule is to lower the initial fee from 250 to 150 and go up on the number of marginal units that you need to make up the difference in revenues um, and I'll give up on my inspection side for now and just you know to, ma to make it so Mandy if that's I didn't play enough did I need to go up to 20 you know, on marginal. So it would be the maximum a larger building would pay would be, you know, X. So it's in the scale. So that would be the one change because the the units that are six or less are still going to fit hit the inspection fee and a marginal inspection fee for each of their units. So the first year is still going to be costly for them. So I want to uh, lower on the registration side. So that would be the one fee amendment I would make. And for now, I since Mandy said it would be better to bring that up for the whole council on a, do I change the inspection threshold for sampling to 10? And I can make that during the council meeting as a recommendation. I can leave that off this the list for us for now. So that would be my friendly amendment to Bob's, I think, motion to recommend the fee schedule as received, the most recent CRC. And Shane is saying, but go down on the 250 to 150, but go up on the number of units to make up the difference. And someone can figure out what that is. So I'm going to uh, recognize Mandy in a second, but uh, Kathy, while you're listening, if you draft a motion that you think is a, a motion that would be appropriate to conclude our discussion when to put on the table uh, give you a moment to think about that mandy what are your thoughts so 
I, I will go through a couple of things. Um, so Kathy's suggestion of going down to 150 for non-owner occupied parcels as in a base fee with $50 for each additional unit up to 20 units would create a maximum per parcel there of a pro, uh, of 1100 I believe um and would on the spreadsheet require town support of $99,000 approximately. So nearly the entire uh, um, safe and healthy neighborhood revenue from the strategic partnership agreement. So that's that's the 150 with an increase um, on the fee schedule you've got, the permit residential fee A2 would read for all other parcels, 150 plus 50 per unit over one unit up to a maximum of $1,100 per parcel is how that one would read. That would use nearly all or basically all of the $100,000 from health and safety neighborhoods. To give you another option, if you go down to one, and, and this is where I'm still working on stuff, 175, um, you you would if you go from a base fee of 175 instead of 150 with that same max well the maximum would then be if you're going for 20 units the maximum would be 1125 you would then use 71000 of it um but if you wanted to change that maximum down to um from 20 units to 15 units again, um, then you would, I think you would use 85,000. So you could do 150 um, 150,000, uh, sorry, $150 on the base fee. So A2 could read 150 plus 50 per unit over one unit up to a maximum of 1100 per unit um, per parcel. And you'd use 100,000 of the 100,000. It could read 175 plus $50 per unit over one unit with a maximum of, um, give me a second here, of 875. And that would use uh, 85,000 of the safe and healthy neighborhoods money. Those are two options. I'm just trying to calculate some of the stuff that Kathy said so that the motion would be right, depending on what you want. So if you want to go down to 150, you do need to go up to 20 units, that 1100 max. Um, to be able to generate enough revenue using all of the safe and healthy neighborhood revenue. If you go down to 175 instead of 150 as a base number, um, then you can choose to um, add that per unit cost up to 15 units instead of 20 units. And then you would use 85,000 of the 100,000. Mandy, is it helpful to to put numbers in here? Um, you can, but you have to play with some other sections too. But we can put some in if you'd like to. I can tell you what cells to put them in. Is that helpful to the committee? Do we need that for the motion? Uh, no, the motion is would actually be on the rental registration fee schedule. It's not on the Excel sheet. And the motion on the fee schedule is section A2. Okay, I can. And, and Athena, you can't easily do it because the change Mandy's doing, it, it is a secondary sheet when yeah. she goes to yeah. something more than nine. So yeah. you'll never get to the right number in terms of the fee collection. 
<laughs> There's some extra cells that need to change. Okay. So and just that's quickly, the I want to talking about. Okay. And I just want to note that Anna's rejoined. So, Mandy, can you just tell me? Um... So, section A2, the first 250, if you change it to 150, you then have to change the maximum of 700, would be maximum of 1100. And what that now reads is, that that 1100 is up to 20 units. So you would be paying the additional 50 per unit for 19 more units. Um, so you'd pay it for every, th that fee would go up until you have, it would stay steady once you've hit 20 units or more on a parcel. The 21st unit would not incur additional right. per unit costs. So that's the one that Kathy recommended. That would use 100, thousand of the hundred thousand and that's the one mandy i uh, i don't have time to get out a full screen and i don't have one of those great double things where i can have it open on the other one to just check your math um i'm i'm so the, I'm, the math is slightly estimated because um the the rental permit breakdown we have this is where it gets into problems we have a 10 to 19 rental units and there are 19 non-owner occupied parcels with 10 to 19 rental units and i'm my math is assuming that every single one of them is 19 units right and it's not and so we don't we we can't once we change the number from 10 to something above that we can't fully easily estimate what the how many are at 12 units versus 13 and all so it's probably a slight overestimation of the um and then, then, that come in can but i ask you on the, of those. so the reinspection fee in the current sheet is 250 is what i'm remembering um did you have 250 in the the one that got sent to us or was it just 150 no, the the permit fee is two fifty. The inspection fee, no matter what type of inspection, is one fifty in the sheet. As and there's not an easy way of saying reinspection is a higher cost because you don't know how many you're going to do. Correct. So we've calculated potentially some of that. Rob recommended not doing that. Um, his recommendation was do a flat inspection fee. They will charge it for all of the permit required inspections, and they may or may not always charge it for any other inspection, um, is what he told CRC. Okay, so if, if we went in this direction, we're generating a larger shortfall than what you came up with, even though we went up to 20 based on this quick calculation, correct? Yes. Okay. And that, just so everyone understands, that's why I did the frequency and um, I'd be willing to go up on the inspection fee to 175. You know, if you did what's the, what happens if you do the inspection fee at 175? Because the little guys will not, be hit as often because of the little good guys, the, the ones that are uh, get a clean record will only get hit. So I wasn't trying to generate a deficit. So just everyone understands my, that's not what I was trying to do. Um, and I wouldn't want to start the program knowing that in steady state, we're not covering our costs unless UMass does this every year. So yeah. That was would, not. That was never my intention. Yeah. And uh, when you say cover all your costs, of course, it's covering all the costs. I assume in year one, what do we do in year two and beyond when salaries and health insurance increases? Bernie. Yeah, I think where this leads us is we're gonna. <laughs> we should simply take the document that's in front of us that with the two hundred and fifty rather. Um, that came over that's posted in the packet um, and move that off to the, move that onto the council because the as it was originally written this is my understanding please correct me as it's originally written it covers all but maybe fifteen thousand dollars worth of the uh, safe and healthy neighborhood money so it, it the the CRC's proposal 
uh, more fully funds the program than any of the alternatives that we we've discussed here. Um, you know, people are working with spreadsheets that obviously have lots of formulas in them, and we're winging it. Uh, my preference would be then that we move this to the council, um, and then the and the council then moves it to. Um, uh, where where it needs to go, and then we can take a look at how this works. Because we're we're right now we're you know we're 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 plugging numbers in and and you know well well I'll pass it one fifty but you, how about one seventy five but well maybe do you hear two hundred? Let's just go with what we've got in front of us as as written, um, and take some time to look at the numbers because uh, the licensing folks can always come back and suggest change after they have a chance to, 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 to finesse this and to look a little harder at the math. But I think for Rob's purposes, it's important to get this off the ground. I also agree with Rob that you shouldn't have a, uh, um, you, you shouldn't have a, 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 a reinspection fee because the, the temptation there is to uh, count money that you, you, you're not, you may or may not get. The reinspection, I assume that the reinspection. Uh, the in inspection fee at 150, keeping it that way seems to me to be, uh, I would ag ag agree with, with uh, the uh, CRC and with Rob that, that, that keeping that figure uh, is there because that gives them the opportunity to apply that fee each time they go back to do a reinspection if it's necessary. And if you want it to be a little, if you want it to be punitive on the, the landlord who's a bad actor, then that's the way to, that's the way to do it because the inspector has to come back three times. Well, now you're looking at 450 bucks. Hopefully that's, that's real money to whoever owns the, uh, uh, owns the offending unit. Uh, but at this point, um, you, you know, we're not doing, we're we're guessing, and um, uh, I would prefer to go with, um, and I'm assuming that CRC and, and Rob has, have done, uh, you know, uh, Mandy's a very thorough person, and I'm assuming that she and her committee, and the building inspector, have, uh, the inspection director, have gone over this the numbers here time and time and time again, and um, this is you know this is the place to start. So, are we at a point somebody's going to make a motion? I guess Bernie is really suggesting a motion. I'm not sure if we've ever determined whether resident members can move or second. I'm assuming we can. I don't think so. <laughs> so, I... Uh, The motion would be to recommend to the, that you're suggesting though, would be to recommend to the council that they adopt the fee schedule as recommended by CRC. Yeah, with, with the understanding that it can be amended in the future. I think it's, we all recognize that. You put an initial. And Andy, is that your motion? No, I haven't made it yet, but okay. I think that I would, I'm getting towards it. Um, to make the motion be that Finance Committee recommends that for the first year of the program that the registrate that the fees be as recommended by CRC you could write that out as uh, with the name of the committee and the reason that I would put that forward in that fashion is it would force the council to come back during its first year to revisit the issue but allow the program to get going. So I, I'll put that out as a motion. If it's seconded, then we can, we'll discuss it as a motion. Andy, may I make a 
it's sort of a point of order. Yes. The bylaw as written, if adopted, allows the council to set the fees first, and then all other changes to the fees are done by the bylaw, the Board of License Commissioners. So once the council adopts a fee schedule under the current bylaw proposal, if adopted, after the first vote of the council, the fee schedule reverts to um, the Board of License Commissioners for mm -hmm. any subsequent right. changes. Good point. That doesn't that much was... change the motion because you come back to the fact that it would just require that uh, the Board of mm -hmm. License Commissioners has to make that decision during the uh, first year as to what the second year fees would be. It would not be a council action. Lynn? I was going to make the same point Mandy Joe did, and that is the way it's written. It We basically turn it over to, frankly, the experts who have been setting our other fees and who have been involved in this discussion. For the purpose of a discussion, I'm going to second the motion. Okay. So, Athena, do you have a motion? I do. I have to recommend that for the first year of the program, the fees be as recommended by the Community Resources Committee. So, further discussion on the motion? Um, Matt, are you just coming back now? I am just getting back in. Sorry, Andy. Then you should know that there's a, we, we've had substantial discussion all your way that there's a motion on the floor now. And the motion on the floor is to recommend that for the first year that the fee be as recommended by the Community Resources Committee. Okay, I support that motion. And while well, we haven't taken, we're not to the point of taking a vote. We're just in the at that point of seeing if there's anybody else who has something to say on the motion. Kathy oh. has been. We've been discussing a proposal that Kathy had made, which would be an alternative approach that would require. Um, I don't know if you want to state it again one last time, but it would. It would change the um, number of units to be inspected. Um, it it did two things. It went up on the cap instead of nine. It went higher, so you collected more from the registration fee, and it looked for a way of doing fewer inspections. So I still do balanced, um, and I I continue to think that's fair. So I've already taken enough of the committee's time with playing with those two numbers. And I think that the Mandy, is, Mandy is absolutely correct. If you just go up on the number of units and go down on the registration fee, it will not as completely cover costs as what had been proposed. That's why I had to look at the inspection side. But I feel like we're putting more of the burden on the smaller units than we need to do. The smaller owners with smaller total units than we need to, um, right. that are less able to vary. But I I did my best to try to explain a different approach and it's clear it's it's not it's not resonating. So I'm not gonna press the point. And I, I was here for the um for that discussion for for the spreadsheet, Kathy. So I, I saw that I appreciated your work on it. Um, okay. Andy I, I have a I have a comment on this. I, I mean, I don't know if it's appropriate now, but I, I did have some some thoughts on the um, the fee structure, and I have looked at it for for a while now. Um, is now that now the time, Andy? Yeah, go ahead, and then uh, because uh, otherwise we'd be at, at the boat. So go ahead and make well, your comments, please. I, I'll just say this briefly because I I am going to wind up voting in support of the fee structure as proposed. I think it's I think it's a reasonable way for the for the program to finance itself. Um, and I am really grateful to Mandy Joe and CRC and, and town staff for all this work. Um, I think there, you know, there's there's two really clear problems that this work is solving. You know, one is um, substandard conditions in some of our rentals. Um, 
and particularly circumstances where, you know, the landlord is at fault and where there's, you know, there's dereliction there. Um, and then we also, we have an incomplete database of, of rental units. Um, and I, I think this addresses that. And those, those are two really important things that, um, that this accomplishes. So I, I am going to support it, but I want to just voice my, my three areas of concern um, on this, on this bylaw. You know, the first is just the, the increase on the head count. You know, Paul used that phrase when he's giving us the financial indicators presentation. And, you know, we're talking about adding two, two additional inspectors, you know, with full benefits um, onto this team. And then uh, I, I get the sense that the administrative burden might be, might be fairly high. So I am, um, also thinking that that there might need to be an additional administrative support person attached to this at some point as well. Um, I know we haven't seen that, but but that's a concern of mine. Um, and then we've had pretty open conversation about the potential cost being passed along to renters, and you know that's an area of concern for me um, as well. And then finally, I think this is a more of a broad a broad point, but um, you know I do worry that that. Our reg the culture we have, um, the regulatory culture that we have in town, um, this this sort of increases our, our regulatory and bureaucratic um, function, which of course is not a bad thing unto itself, but I think is something that we as a town need to be aware of is is that um, aspect of our of our governance. Um, one thing that that I asked Rob in our very first meeting on this was just to to clearly state that you know town staff if they suspect a property is in poor condition, you know, they can file their own complaint and conduct their own investigations. Cause I think there's, there's a misconception out there that the only way that uh, we can uh, inspect a property is if there's a, a, a complaint and, and that's true, but that complaint can originate from town staff as well. So, um, but obviously these are things that are sort of outside of the purview of finance as Mandy Joe has pointed out. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to not support the, uh, the motion on, on that, on those grounds, I've played with the spreadsheets a little bit, um, and I think it's a, a sound way, a sound scheme for, for financing this. Um, but I just, I wanted to get those out there on the record, Andy. So thank you for the time, and I apologize. I was, I was pulled away. Okay, thank you. You shared with me that you had that problem, Lynn. Um, I first of all, I want to thank CRC and Mandy Joe as chair, but I also want to thank Kathy for, you know listening to and being sensitive to issues we've heard in public comment, and we have heard those comments. Uh, I Additionally, I want to point out, in fact, in the packet for this year is the annual report from the Board of License Commissioners. And so one of the things that we're looking to them to do is to, as they have been doing with other fees they're in charge of, to assess whether this is the best way to make this work. And in doing that, I wanna make sure that they don't lose sight of the goal, the, the goals that mean that uh, Kathy has been trying to advance with her additional um, model, if you will, with her slight changes to the model. So that's, I just, I think it's terrific that we put this in the hands of the Light Board of Licensing Commissioners. I think CRC has worked closely with them as they've come forward with that recommendation, and uh, they regularly report to us. So that's all good. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. So with that, I don't see any other hands, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, assume that we're ready to vote. And uh, does anyone uh, want to request that a, Athena read the motion again, or are we all settled on it? Seeing no requests, we'll go ahead to the vote. Anna? I'm going to abstain since I missed the bulk of the discussion today. Lynn? Aye. Bob? Uh, support. Matt? Support. Bernie? Support. Kathy? Yes, did you say? Uh, didn't you hear? No. Can, you voted can, no? I, I think I'm unmuted, yeah. Okay, I didn't hear the first, but I heard the second. 
I'm going to vote yes, and Alicia is absent, so I need to um, get advice from Athena. That motion passes with two in support, one no, and one, one abstention, absent. and one absent. Okay. Interesting. Okay. It's an interesting vote to report, to have to explain, but... Uh, We'll do the best we can, uh, but it's not going to be able to get done before the Monday meeting, I don't think, Lynn. I think we're pretty well exhausted on our getting our one report out. Um, sure, that's that's oh. fine. I I would prefer that we. Um, I prefer we try to do it Monday. And, I mean, especially see what I can do. Yeah. Uh, in working with uh, Kathy, I have to talk to later. See if we think we can together come up with a report, and, if, and we'll let you know. It's Great. not going to have much time to get circulation to the committee because of the timing. Yeah. Okay, so that said, um, the next thing we're going to have to work on, and we don't really have much time today, so I, I think the most important thing is to schedule our next meeting. And uh, I believe that we had two Fridays who were put down as possibilities. The first, which if I recall, is the um, a week from today. That's uh, correct. Is everyone, is there anyone who's not available? Let me put it that way. Um, can, you t can you tell me what date that is? The 11th. The, the, I'm not it's the 8th the and the 15th. Um, Andy? Yeah. I just wanted to note that the 8th, the um, staff holiday gathering is beginning at three o'clock. So I would just ask the committee to be aware of that for the staff that are participating in the meeting. The meeting um, we had scheduled for one o'clock. So we're scheduled, can I just, we're scheduled for December 8th and December 15th? That's what yes. we had planned on, yes. The last council meeting is the 18th. So I was going to suggest on the before we get into the uh, make a final decision on this, there are a couple of questions I want to ask um, everyone on the committee regarding the guidelines. And um, then I think I would like to work with Kathy's draft, my draft together and see if we can come up with proposed guidelines and get them out to the committee for the next round of discussion and see how quickly we can handle it. The questions that I have is, can we assume that the proposed operating budget increase for all uh, of the major functional areas being the elementary and regional schools and municipal functions and library are equal at 3%. So that that's one question. Anna? Sorry, that mute button was further away than I thought. Andy, won't we get a better idea of that after the four towns meeting, specifically about the, the schools, or is that will that not be related to this at all? I think that we're trying to give guidance in some ways to the schools. What usually happens is that uh, the finance director at the school then takes our number and plugs it in and makes a recommendation so that giving some um, this discussion today will give some guidance to uh, the uh, to the schools for uh, any final decisions that they're going to make on how they present. 
Okay. Yeah. I mean, the reason I bring it up is I, I believe it's been the past two years that the schools have come in with um, requesting more than the two and a half percent. And so I just, I want us to take that under advisement in terms of how we're communicating that expectation to the, the um, school committee, but then also, you know, what we're bringing to four towns in terms of, in terms of, is it reasonable or are we just setting ourselves up to have to navigate that again um, for whatever reason? Uh, with that makes sense. Note that uh, the uh, financial trends uh, report suggested we could start at three. Kathy? Yeah, I, you know, even though I sent you a draft with that wording in it, Andy, I'd like to have a quick discussion on the library budget because the fiscal year we're talking about, the library will be physically, if assuming we go ahead with the construction will be completely closed. So I would like to know why we have to have the same increase for the library. So that I would just like to have an, because I, there's some, I understand it's mainly labor costs that are underneath it, but there are utility costs. There's some supply costs, there's whatever. So I would like to just have enough information to know whether equal makes sense this year, coming fiscal year. And honest question about education is this is the year they lose ESSER. So we've got two things going on where one we know is going to have a shortfall. So I would just like enough more information to say, do we depart from the historical pattern that are avoided looking at budgets very closely? with a little bit more of a discussion on those two pieces. I trust the projections of revenues. So I think there is no more to be had. You know, we're living within a, it's 333 or something that does a balance. So I have no problem with that assumption. I think, and we recognize Lynn, just a second, I see your hands up too. I think that if we didn't come in with a recommendation that's based upon just leading with an even percentage, as has been the historical pattern, that we would have to also consider then requesting that the budget coordinating group uh, make a recommendation to the finance committee and that we do the guidelines with le essentially leaving that portion undetermined at the initial phase and uh, have the new finance committee, as soon as it convenes, uh, get a recommendation from BCG, I don't know, is a practical way, whether there's another way to handle it. So I just want to put that out onto the table as a part of this discussion. Lynn? Yeah. Can I just follow up on that, Andy? We could the other thing could be that our town manager can do some due diligence and report back to us on some of this because asking anyone to cut their own budget is a difficult issue. Um, you know, so just trying to do scrutiny. So I raised the library as a question. You know, there won't be utility fee, and so that it was raised as a question rather than a what will I do with that? Um, and BCG is a different kind of animal in terms of each group. No one's going to raise their hand and said, sure, I can take 10% less or I can have a flat budget. Um, I don't think willingly anyway. So that would be another way of writing the wording. Paul? Yeah, so I could I could look into that, Kathy, but my, inst my instinct is that there are costs that come in in addition and then there are costs that are, that are uh, taken off. So I'll, I will look into that for you. Thanks. I just want to um, review a little bit of what has has been the practice in the past, and that is that at the meeting we have in December, the school committee basically will show us, possibly show us, two budgets. One is, what would it be if we just kind of maintained everything and, you know, projected out? And I don't know that they're going to go beyond that in the December meeting. 
it does seem to me as much as nobody is going to stand up and say, oh, here's my budget, please take it, uh, that we are looking at two, at least two, and I'm sure if the town wanted to weigh in, they could add in another unknown factor, but we are looking at two, some pretty serious variations. Uh, one is the school and the loss of the ESSER funds, and the second one is, in fact, uh, what impact will um, the libraries moving to temporary quarters have on their budget? Uh, and that, in fact, in my mind, does call for a BCG meeting at a point in time where maybe we have more of those, um, the more knowledge about that. Um, you know, the library hopefully will have be going out finding space. They'll get a sense of what that space is going to cost. We may get a sense of what the loss of ESSER is going to have on us when we do the December uh, regional meeting. Uh, so, and and as we all know, this is a free floating uh, number until the governor comes forward with their budget sometime in January. So, we have a lot of unknowns. I think we need to recognize those in the financial guidelines, but I think we also need to accept the fact that whether or not anybody's going to come forward and says, yes, yes, please take 50000 from my budget to balance this budget, um, we still should do that within the, the recognition that we do have a BCG um, and that that committee does have the authority to at least have that discussion. Thank you. Unless Paul is able to give us any guidance, which he said he would try, but he can, can't assure right. that he will, uh, then we don't have any, I don't know what else we have. Anna? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I appreciate the, the reference to calling a BCG meeting. I think that was what I was asking for one of the last times that we talked. Um, and this is why. I think that there are changes this year, and I think that we need to pull these groups <clears throat> together. Um, as we create these guidelines. So I, I would fully support that, um, the, the plan as you outlined it, Andy, Andy with uh, coordinating a BCG meeting and leaving those parts um, to, to be finalized after that meeting. There was some hesitation expressed also about BCG and the political nature uh, that that places into the process. Um, we have not had an experience with that in recent years. And so we are really inviting something very different into the process if we do that. Um, that is something that we've got to resolve at our next meeting. Um, I'm assuming 10.5% for capital unless there's um, somebody else is going to say something different. Uh, and uh, so that's a second issue, though, that at least needs to be out there for uh, consideration. And then I uh, uh, think the third one I'm thinking about is on the municipal side is uh, a recommendation that uh, we just say that continuation of current programs is a significant value and uh, the programs should only be cut if it, uh, there's a, a strategic reason to do so as far as that that's going to, if so, that's going to leave very little money for anything additional. And uh, the only thing that, we, that would seem appropriate to say is that uh, we uh, suggest that the town manager make what he determines to be the most appropriate budget recommendations on May 1st, consistent with the council uh, guide, uh, guidelines that we're giving for goals so that uh, they essentially follow the the council that council guidance and not trying to incorporate it into the financial guidelines. Paul, 
Yeah, I just have to say, uh, I'll catch up with um, Holly on this later, but I have to, I'm, I'm nine minutes late for another meeting. I got people waiting. So I'm going to sign off now, just to let you know okay. that. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Uh, Kathy? Hey, the two other items just to have people have on their plate. One is uh, there's been a vote to give the council an increase in stipends. And we have a specific amount of money because it would start in the next fiscal year. So we should put that in the guidelines because uh, and we have a we have a number to pl plug in. And I think the draft I sent you, Andy, left a, a blank because I didn't have time to look at it. And the other part, and I'd be happy to have people react to it, is there is the potential to bring in grant funds where the grant funds support the staff to implement the grants. And so we shouldn't discourage, we should, I would, would want to be encouraging that type of, you know, self-finance, not just bring in the money, but bring in the money to implement it. And conversely, I would like to start to have a better process. And I wrote some words like this, is before we make, a purchase, which everyone likes, even if the council wants it. We do due diligence to talk about all the associated costs. If we go this route, it will require the following additional, whether it's operating costs or demolition costs, that, that we do a better job of, of total budgeting before we make an investment decision. And there's one specific example of it. It was driven by the council. But I think the council needs to be better at it. And, that, and then our town manager needs to say, hey, by the way, if you want me to do this, it has the following consequences. So I'd just like to put those somewhat in gentle wording in the guidelines. Do you want to share with the council? It, well, the example that's come up um, is we voted to use ARPA money. And ARPA money is not free money. I think of it as an alternative tax resource for us that was federal taxes. But we should think of it as we, we bought um, a property for a permanent shelter. It looks like it might have toxic substances on the land. So there might be cleanup needed. It We don't have the money to demolish the current building. And we don't have the money to build another building. And we don't have the money to operate it. So all of those are look like an easy decision to just buy it. Um, so, so it would just be a decision. There was a fuller picture. It wasn't, you know, was um, Lynn made the comment when we first ran about be careful if you apply for a grant and the grant brings operating costs and other costs that you look at the full picture of it. You just don't look at, you know, an opportunity opportunistic bringing in money. So I'd be writing wording like that, you know, that you you think through two, three years down the road. But I've also seen a couple other towns on the flip side. Uh, there was a terrific example in East Hampton if they wanted to do an RFP for thinking of surplus property, and they somehow got the state to finance consultant report to really help the town think through what they wanted to do, draft an RFP and help them rate it. And so the town didn't have to staff up for that. They got state money to do it, redevelopment money. So I thought that was a really strategic way of taking what we have as a short, we don't have enough staff to do that kind of work. And they had an amazing RFP. And if you looked at it, and I thought, who did that work? And it was they had this consultant that was free to the town in terms of tax resources. So that was a different, a different way of thinking about applying for funds that supplement um, staffing. That it's not wasn't permanent staff person added on. So I, there, I have two different examples that that go in different ways. And I don't want to, you know, glorify the guidelines. Yeah. Just think of these as you know, be, uh, being careful. <laughs> yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Lynn? Uh, yeah, I want to mention that we do have a commitment to the possibility of needing to fund a consultant that um, will work with the 2024 um, Charter Review Committee. 
we don't know for sure that we'll need that, but we need to leave that open as a possibility. And Lynn, that's in the town services side, right? The municipal side of the budget? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Lynn, Lynn stole one of the things I was going to mention. Uh, Kathy, I, I don't, you've referred to the draft that you have written or the changes that you've made to a draft, but I don't see that in any of the SharePoint packets and I don't think I have it. Now that we've talked about it at the meeting, would you mind sending it to me so I can add it so other members can see? Sure, you know, Andy had asked us to send any redlined thoughts. So I, you know, if, if that's okay with you, Andy, I, mar I took the old one and just marked it up. And, you know, I've been really careful of not sharing opinions before um people get so you know it has i more appreciate that but now that we've talked about it now that you've talked about it at the meeting it's okay um to share with no, the community no, if, if it's a <clears throat> kathy it's okay with me uh, it's okay with you because i know you were working on revisions too you know so i'd be I'm more than happy to, um, you know, and I, I had some strong wording on ARPA money as well, that ARPA money, now's the time to use it for town investments that are going to, they're delayed in, in the queue. Um, so it was, uh, you know, let's go for it with roads, you know, just trying to think of our cap, we have a capital shortfall in front of us, and we have a potential source of capital money that's one-time money, but that's ideal for capital projects that are one-time spending. So I'm happy to put it in the packet. Yeah, I just, if, if you could send it to me, Kathy, so I can post it online, that would be great. Thank you. When you do just add something along the top that um, makes it very clear that this was a draft provided by uh, mm -hmm. committee member, Councillor Shane, uh, for discussion purposes. Uh, only or something like that. And then that. I had one other quick question, Andy, and that's that we included on the council agenda for Monday a, a first kind of look at the budget guidelines for council so that the committee can gather feedback for the draft that will come before the council on the 18th. Will you have a draft ready for Monday? No, uh, there's no draft for Monday. I would uh, suggest in the yeah, in the absence of a draft that people you we include last year's and that people just give you ideas. Or we could uh, do a quick report uh, in addition listing the uh, topics that we discussed today. Yeah, you know, I looked at the agenda, Lynn. I like I like doing last year without my you have a packed agenda for for Monday night. So putting it in the packet saying this is what we're starting with would be I'm not making it super short. <laughs> yeah. But great. I mean, I'm just think, thinking you've got potentially a very, we have potentially a very long meeting. It ain't just me, baby. It's all of us. <laughs> Thank you. And we, I should have said we have. <laughs> Thank you. I'll put last, I'll put last year's in the packet. Thank you. And and then Andy being prepared to discuss what we talked about today is just a great way to get people thinking. And then we've at least had one initial discussion at a council meeting because the following meeting on the 18th is ostensibly our last. I know. <laughs> this is uh, becoming problematic as to whether we're going to be able to get guidelines done for the end of the year. It's going to be a real challenge. So back to the uh, last question, which was the one that we postponed to get the other pieces out, which is finding date for uh, next finance committee meeting. And I would suggest we do it as early as uh, we possibly can, uh, which would actually, if we could get a, uh, you know, we'd have to, to really do a quick, kind of poll to the committee uh, since we have so many people, members now who are not here of whether there are any days in the week earlier that we can still do notice on if we have to do uh, if we're not going to get responses back to Monday we probably it's a really Thursday or Friday because I don't see that we could get a uh, come up with an agreement by two for uh, 
for Wednesday done in time to, to make it work. Are you talking about next week? Yeah. For the sake of discussion, I'll put out the idea of no, of December 7th at 3. Andy, if you wanted to try and schedule something on Wednesday, you can always post it. And if it doesn't work, cancel it. I, I like the seventh better than the sixth. Okay. I can do, I can do. Oh, other people are, seventh. but seventh, seventh at three works for me. I uh, you were saying. It works for me too. I mean, I'm okay. I can make that work. So it's Thursday. So in recognizing the point about staff not being available, Anna? Yeah, I can do the Thursday at three. Wednesday, I'm not available. Andy, are you suggesting Thursday instead of Friday or in addition to Friday? No, I would say just one. Uh, but you had raised the uh, problem that there's the pressure of the staff uh, the, the seventh is better for me. I have a school okay. building committee meeting all morning on the eighth. The seventh is just a better. It's better. Um, the eighth is not impossible, but it looked like you just had one, two, three, four counselors say the seventh works, and I didn't hear Bob or Bernie say it doesn't work for them. So why well, don't Bob we... said it does work for him? Yeah, it works for me. So it, let's. It's marginal for me, but I, I'm pretty certain I can do it. It's, so let's just choose to say the seventh at three. Three, yeah. Okay. And if we have to, we'll hold the eighth at one, but hopefully not. And then can you tell me on the week of the 11th, you think we're meeting the 12th and the 15th? No. Yes. Anyway, someone just send me send me dates to block because I have to move. I don't have to move anything. But so if we met on the seventh, there's a chance we'd get a draft done, and then if you and then Lynn, we're reporting to the council for the 18th, right? That's yeah. correct. Okay, and I can meet on the 12th of December. So that, that would be a one to three. That works fine on my my in my life. Anna, what about you? Sorry, it's I'm going back between Zoom and my calendar, and it's a little tough to do quickly. Um, the twelfth, I at one. You're saying? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can I can make that work if we need it. It's really accommodating us. Yeah. So we could potentially get it done if we have those two meetings and then people get to see the draft to comment before it gets submitted, right? Right. I'm also assuming that the carryover memo for the finance committee is close to nothing. It's it's the surplus property one we're carrying over. There's right. that one. There's that one. There's also streetlights. Once it comes back from the town manager, it'll go to TSO with input from finance. And then waste hauler is also a finance committee input before um, it comes Do we back have to, to carry over anything from AHRA? Yes. Yes, that too. Yeah. Okay. So there is a carryover over memo. I, it would be great if we could do those two days, the, you know, next next Thursday and next and the Tuesday after. Okay. It's it's unlikely I will be at the uh, the meeting of the twelfth. I will make every effort, but I, I can't guarantee it. Bernie, that's terrific. Thank you. Andy, yeah, did you I, want I, to keep I, the I can make the twelfth. Did you want to keep the fifteenth? Did you want to keep the fifteenth as well in case you need it? I'd always keep it. Okay. I'd keep it, but I think it's unlikely. Okay, thanks. I'd put it in the... Uh... Andy, did we do public comment? Yes, we did. Okay. It was so oh, long. I think it was so long. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> we asked for public comment, nobody asked. <laughs> it's the best one ever. Um, so that said, I think that we have concluded uh, the agenda for today. And I have no other unanticipated or business. So I think that uh, we can be adjourned. And uh, anybody who's trying to get down to see it. The Merry Maple at four o'clock still is time. Great. Bye, everyone. Have, Have a nice night. Weekend. Okay. Thank I'll you. Talk to Kathy. Thanks.